Monica, where were you on the day that the Senate finally got to voting on the impeachment of the President? Well, actually, I was here in New York, and um, I just caught the tail end of that day and watched the momentous vote. Um, and uh, I was quite relieved for the country that it was over. I think my own personal feelings, um, I didn't quite didn't yet have a sense of relief that I think I had hoped to have or that I thought I might have, maybe because I didn't feel that it was uh, over for me yet. But I was certainly happy for the president and for the country. For you, do you have regrets that it ever happened? Well, I think from every, every experience you have, every relationship you're in, you, you grow in as a person and you learn about yourself and so from that vantage point this was a big part of my life and he was very important to me the consequences of that relationship were certainly far beyond what I could have ever imagined they'd be on the days and there are many when I don't have very warm feelings towards the president I regret the entire relationship and ever having met him and when you talk about never having foreseen the extraordinary consequences, but what did you anticipate might flow from it? Um, that varied at different points in the relationship. There was um, a time when I had hoped that um, the president and I might have some sort of a future after he was out of office um, and his life was a little quieter. There were times that I thought that this would just be a pleasant memory or maybe an unpleasant memory, but that it would just be something that I would have kept with me for my life and, and had shared with a small group of people. But when you see him on television now, do you sometimes hate him and sometimes love him? Not love him, but sometimes I hate him. Sometimes I hate him, sometimes I, um, I turn the channel quickly. Can we get back then to the beginning of it all. The, the environment that you arrived at in, in the White House, what did you find there? Were people talking about him in terms of, of women and song? Yes, it actually, I, I was pretty surprised. Um, I had not, I did not find the president <laughs> remotely attractive before I came to Washington, before I even saw him in person. So sort of this, this notion that um, like high school almost at the White House with a lot of you'd hear a lot of the female interns gossiping and, and workers men and women sort of talking about the president in a way as if he was almost the uh, star of the football team. What was your picture of him when you came? I had a lot of respect for him as a president. I um, liked the energy that he and the first lady brought to the administration. I but physically the sort of guy you might have an affair with? Not at all. <laughs> um, Too old? Um, yes, and um, I think that you don't see on TV or in pictures his, his spirit and his energy, which um, is very much a part of him. Then you did see him in the flesh, and maybe three or four times mm -hmm. in sort of public moments. So what was the contrast from the man you'd seen in photographs and not particularly been drawn to. Oh, it was a humongous contrast. Um, it, uh, the first time I saw him in person, it, it sort of took my breath away. Um, he has a very magnetic sense about him and he's uh, very sensual and attractive and draws you in to his, to his energy, really. You've talked elsewhere about him giving you the full Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. What is the full Bill Clinton? Um, <laughs> it's, uh, he, he just sort of, he looks at you and he, he locks eyes with you and he sort of peels away the layers of your being with his eyes and with his energy and his spirit and it's um it's very intense the full bill clinton that you describe mm -hmm. you seem to have got the most vivid experience of in that rather impromptu birthday party when he was 49 i think mm -hmm. uh, 
tell me what happened. Well, I think um, I had actually the first time that that we had had a very um, in our first intense sort of connection had been the day before the birthday party, and. Um, I had I was wearing what I now called or then called my lucky green suit and um, I went home the day of the birthday party after I found out we were going to be able to attend put my lucky green suit back on thinking well maybe he'll recognize me from the day before and lo and behold he did and so it was um, you know it was a, a game of flirtation going back and forth throughout the party and when he uh, came down shaking hands on the rope line we um, made more of a connection. Did you feel a kind of a, a sexual thing about it? Yes. He made you tingle? <laughs> um, yes, I guess. And at that stage, did you already want it to go further? Um, I think it was something I certainly thought about. I don't know that it... Um, it was something I was open to, but I don't know that it, um, it was a game plan, if that, if that makes sense. I mean, it's, it's a bit crude to put it this way, but your feelings were of not yet love by any means. No, no, lust. lust. Mm -hmm. I think um, I'm someone, in, and I think a lot of people of my generation too are were much more comfortable with our sexuality and that's certainly something I am and, and I think it needs to be honored and cherished and um, I that was what I was in touch with and in touch with with him as well so now this all then collided with the shutdown of the government and suddenly all the civil servants had gone because nobody was paying them and you as interns mm -hmm were suddenly thrown into the fray to get on and do the jobs. Mm -hmm. And bubbling along in your mind, were you sort of saying, hey, this is going to be, bring me closer to the president? I'm sure that crossed my mind. I, um, I don't think that was a, um, a motivation, more just a tantalizing thought. Very early in this period then, I mean, within a day of the shutdown, you really did have an occasion to see him very close. Mm -hmm. Just. Tell me about that first encounter. The situation was such that we found ourselves alone in a, in a room together and we were small talking and I was very nervous and I remember thinking to myself, well, well this is your chance so you better tell him that you're interested <laughs> otherwise he's not going to know what to do. So I told him that I had a crush on him and um, we went into his back office and um, had our first private conversation and it was the first time he kissed me. There's one small element you left out though and that was what is dwelt upon in the Star <laughs> Report which is the the, the, yes. the the revealing of your underwear. <laughs> Much has been made of that and it um, I think anybody who um, has been in a relationship and has gone through sort of this uh, I don't know if you want to call it the courtship or the flirtation mm. period you know, one person does something and does the other one meet them and raise the stakes and it was a very small um, it was a small gesture it was not I don't think it was as big of a deal as everyone else has made it to be but you could have been wrong I could uh, have been I mean you could have misjudged the situation intern sacked for flashing underwear at president mm -hmm. Monica Lewinsky out I think one thing that people have had um, trouble looking at with this relationship in the past year is seeing it as a man and a woman instead of the, the, the president and the intern. And I think if you think of it as a man and a woman, you, most people know when there's an attraction and most people know and that's how relationships get started. And I remember looking at him thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm this close to you and you're so cute. <laughs> and, um, where did you feel it was all going to go? Well, I think I felt, I thought to myself, oh, well, his regular girlfriend is probably furloughed and, and I just got lucky. Um, and that that was a neat, exciting experience. And boy, gee, I hope it would happen again. But I, I didn't know. I didn't know what was going to happen. Do you still think the regular girlfriend had been furloughed, had been uh, laid off because of lack of uh, government funding for the civil servants? Um, 
I don't think so now as much as I did then, but I probably wouldn't be shocked beyond all belief to learn that. This was a big thing to happen to a 22-year-old. Mm -hmm. Did you tell anybody? Of course. First time. <laughs> Straight off after it had happened. Um, not that night of de not that night in detail. No, I mean it, it, for. Um, Your mum was in the flat when you got home. Yes, but it was uh, late by the time I got home, and and um, when I sort of woke her up and said, "Oh, you know, the president kissed me," and um, she, you know, that's nice, and went back to sleep, and and later on had recounted to me that she thought, you know, it was like a kiss on a cheek. Thanks for working so hard. Could you just settle down and go to sleep? No. Mm -mm. No, I was awake for a long time that night, sort of recounting everything that had happened and replaying it in my mind. And it was very difficult, presumably, to shake off the fact that he was the President of the United States. But Not for me. <laughs> it wasn't hard for me. But when you found the man inside, yes. who was he? Well, the person who I thought he was then, uh, as opposed to maybe now, um, was, I, I thought he was a, a brilliant man who had a very big heart who was um, very kind, not necessarily nice, but kind. A person who was, um, had a large sort of appetite for love, and not, I don't mean in the sort of crude sense love, but... He needed loving. Yes, and um, I think me being sort of an emotionally needy person, I could certainly relate to that. Um, I mean, the Starr report, Kenneth Starr seems to see this whole thing as basically sex. Was it anything more than that? Oh, yes. It, um, the sexual aspects of the relationship were just one component of it. It was, um, it was my love. Did he love you? I think in his own way he did. I think in his own way he, he thought that I was special. I don't know about now. I don't know if that's the truth, but I think so. But the sex was very kind of one way, if I can put it in a male sense. It, it really wasn't. It was not one way. That's, um, that's what has been focused on, and that's been very degrading for me as a woman and difficult for me as a woman. Um, you know, I'm a little embarrassed to get too graphic, um, but the the first encounter, he concentrated on me and focused on me more in first before I ever focused on him. And um, so there was, I think there was, was it a completely equal in terms of, of the, the sexual occurrences? Maybe not, but, but this notion that it was a servicing contract and, and mm. he received this and I received nothing is false. He was, at the end of the day, a quarter of a century older than you. He was old enough to be your dad. Yeah. Um, Chelsea's only, you know, six years younger than you. But I think age is, um, age is sort of a number that represents how many years you've been on this planet. It doesn't, I don't think it uh, dictates how you always will interact with someone. Do you think um, he was lonely? I think so. I th I th I'd imagine that the White House is a pretty lonely place. I remember he remarked to me one time how um, he liked the fact that, that I just treated him like a regular person and that most young people were so um, sort of shy in his presence and that I was not. <laughs> so I think that, that there's, I would imagine that being president and being one of the most powerful people in the world and having people treat you accordingly is lonely. But he had a family in, in the residence. What about Hillary? Okay. Did you feel guilty about it? Uh, not at that time. I do now. Um, but I think I felt at the time that I'm sure some of this was deceiving myself. But in, in, I never intended for her to ever find out. So there, there was sort of one of those feelings of, well, what she doesn't know won't hurt her. So now, um, you said earlier that, that one of the things you felt about the relationship was that eventually, after he left the White House, that 
something might come of it. Mm. So it wasn't a futureless relationship. I didn't think so. I, I didn't, it wasn't um, as if I, you know, sort of picking out invitations in China patterns, but um, it was, I certainly thought about it, and it certainly seemed at times that there was a, a possibility that that could happen. Did he ever talk about it? He did once. Um, on July 4th of uh, 97, when we were together, um, he was remarking how he had wished he had more time for me, and I said, well, maybe he will in three years, thinking when he doesn't have all the responsibilities of being president, he'll have some more time on his hands. And he said, oh, well, I might be alone in three years, I don't know. And I was um, quite surprised to hear that. So. Um, I said, well, I think we'd make a good team. <laughs> mm. And um, he smiled at me and, and said, well, what are we going to do when I'm 75 and I have to go to the bathroom 25 times a day? Um, so that, that was certainly an indication to me that, um, th that that was something that crossed his mind. Did he say he loved you? He didn't say he was in love with me, no. So let's, let's talk about you, Monica, and your beginnings. You didn't um, live on the East Coast in Washington. You come from California. You were born in San Francisco? Yes, yes. And um, your family is Jewish. Your grandparents fled the Holocaust. Um, being Jewish has always sort of been my, my culture and my heritage. And um, I think my grandparents' experiences um, certainly instilled in me a, a sense of um, courage in a way. I think being able to see and understand, knowing a little bit more firsthand what people were going through. A happy childhood? <sighs> a mixed childhood. Um, I think I, I was sort of a difficult kid. <laughs> mm -hmm. Always been a little a little adult and um, always known what I wanted and strong-headed, but also uh, was very passionate at an early age and passion has its good side and its bad side. And did you, did you generally get what you wanted? From my mom, yes. <laughs> From dad? Not so much, not so much. He was a, a bit stricter, so. You were only 13 when they got divorced? Yes, yes. Was that a, a painful period? It was. It was, um, it was really sort of the, the shattering of an illusion for me. Even though I knew uh, my parents didn't have this idyllic marriage, I think while they were still married, I always felt that, that we were at least a family unit and that at least there was the, um, I could pretend. Um, so it was, it was upsetting for me. It was hard. Was it a political family? I mean, was your mother political? Did no, no. My dad's a doctor, my mom is a writer, and um, I, I wouldn't say politics was a big part of the family at all. And yet, there you were, headed off after college to the pinnacle of political activity, the White House. Yes. 
Yes. And the other interns that you were thrown together with in mm -hmm. the White House were presumably pretty political, and some of them pretty sort of buttoned-down Washington types, you know. Yes, they were character. much more versed, much more well versed in uh, how Washington works and politics than I was. Were you a bit of a fish out of water? I think so. I think so. Um, I've always had a sense of, I'd like to think, I've always had a sense of style and I've always been very into fashion and, and what I'm wearing and that seemed to not be something that was so important in Washington and styles are different. So yes, I think fish out of water is a, is a, is a good phrase to use. So how early were you, did you begin to become aware that um, some of them perhaps, but certainly other people in the White House, suspected or possibly even knew that you were having a relationship mm. with the president? Well, it was, it really uh, was, I think in my mind it was early on. I had, I also had, I think, a level of, of paranoia about that too, so I was uh, really uh, much more conscious of, of other people and how they were reacting to me. Well, with justice, I mean, it's a very policed place. A lot of yes. secret servicemen, just about every phone conversation monitored. There's certainly with the Secret Service and uh, the staff there, uh, they watch him like a hawk. Um, so we made our plans accordingly. But you had yourself also sort of told quite a few people, hadn't you? Yes, but none Nobody of them... In the White House. No, 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 not at that point. I spoke about him with my girlfriends like I would any other guy. I certainly know that I didn't think about the level of, of difficulty or problems that that could cause. And secretly, presumably, there was a bit of you that was thrilled that people should know a little bit. Not necessarily in that way. My friends knew about my relationship with him as I knew about theirs with, their, with the people in their lives. And so that's how it was. It was sharing. Yes, there was a level of excitement because it was the president, but I don't think it, was, it wasn't bragging about it. Did anybody actually tell you from your circle that perhaps the best thing would be not to go on? Everybody. <laughs> um, I think that not just for uh, political reasons, but I think for my own, probably more out of my own well-being, for concern out of my own well-being than anything else. Was there ever a moment when you thought, hey, I, I, I ought to stop this? Sure. There were, there were a lot of times for different reasons. Um, most often because it was painful. But um, it seemed that every time I would set a deadline in my mind, okay, well, if he doesn't call by this date or he doesn't X, Y, and Z, I'm out, this is, that's it, forget it. And somehow it would always, he'd come through. But it probably was, certainly was, discovery that led to you being thrown out of the White House and given a different job in the Pentagon in the Defense Department. I know that it had to do with uh, the perception of my relationship with the president, whether people suspected something was going on or that it might go on or that I wanted it to happen, I I'm not really sure. The moment you were, as it were, dug out of the White House must have been a pretty shattering one. Yes. Uh, um, th it was shocking and um, very upsetting to me. I thought I'd never see him again. But, but he said he'd bring you back. Did you believe him? I did. I, I believed him that day, and I believed him for the next six months until after the election, and I even believed him into the following year, every time he said he was working on it. But again, I could suggest that he now really had you where he wanted you. He was the person who had to call you, you couldn't call him. He was the person who could summon you, you couldn't summon him. He had total control. He did. He did. Didn't that make you feel yeah, you was... used and, and a victim? Oh. Um... No, no, I, I don't think that that, because certainly I was, I was choosing to be in the relationship. Um, whether I felt like I could help that choice or not, it was my choice, and I chose to, to continue um, in the relationship that way. So I, I, didn't, I didn't think that. I, do I think it was wrong? Do I think it was unfair of him? Yes. You, who had been so close, so intimate with him, now were having to fight to find opportunities on presidential appearances, on lines of people outside the White House and whatever. I mean, what, a, what, a, what an ignominious 
it, reduction. It was. It was. It was hard for me emotionally. Uh, I had always viewed it at that time that I knew that the election was coming up. I knew he had to be careful because of the election. So he would call so frequently, and we'd spend so much time on the phone uh, and having contact that way that it, it was. For me, it was sort of my part as to doing what I could do when I to try and see him whenever I could. And, did it work? And yes, <laughs> it did. So you weren't completely downcast. I mean, that you felt it was still alive. No, oh yes, and and he, of course, when someone's telling you when they talk to you, you know, I'm going to bring you back, or I can't wait till I can see you again. I miss you. I miss kissing you. It, it, that usually would lead you to believe that uh, that this person's still interested. You must have been terribly distressed when, after the election, he didn't call. It was one of the most devastating times for me, and it was um, in that period that I really was so disappointed and so distraught and had some other things going on in my private life, too, that um, I sort of fell prey to Linda Tripp and, and came to make a, the worst judgment call I'd made in my life, which was to... to confide in her. But you needed somebody to confide in desperately. Your uh, mother was in New York no, by now. No, it, it was not so much that. It was that um, it, there had been such a strange um, acquaintanceship, really, with her. And that part of when I, when I first met Linda Tripp, I, I certainly did not confide in her immediately. And as I got to know her and, and came to learn that she had worked at the White House. That was the bond that brought us together. And she would oftentimes say to me, oh, you're just the type of girl the president would like. You've got to go back to the White House. If you were in the West Wing, he'd, oh, you'd have an affair with him, and, and all these things. And that sort of seemed strange to me. But at the same time, that was exactly what I wanted to hear. Well, after this time period, after the election, I hadn't heard from him. It had been the longest period since we'd met in 95 that I hadn't heard from him. I figured, all right, he was full of baloney, and he'd strung me along throughout the election. He didn't mean anything he ever said. And it was at that point when I saw Linda Tripp in the cafeteria, and um, I said to myself, oh gosh, I just, I can't bear to hear this woman say to me one more time, oh, now you have to go back. This is, you know, here you go. Here's the election's over. Go back to the White House. Start this thing. And so I finally just said to her, I had an affair with the president. It's over. So leave it alone. And it was the worst decision I made in my entire life, I think. She uh, says now, she saved your life. Thank God for Linda Tripp. <laughs> I disagree with that. I think she, um, she set me up to try and save my life. I mean, you can't, to try to take credit for something that you caused is, is ludicrous. One of the things she did was to say, you should keep that gap dress <laughs> with the president's semen on it. Mm. Tell us about the dress. That's a big misconception uh, that uh, that I had saved this dress as a souvenir uh, or had and had held on to it. Um, what had you done? It's it's actually it's a it's a pretty regular sort of story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had I had, my weight has always fluctuated throughout my entire life. And uh, the next time I went to put the dress on after I had been with the president, it didn't fit. I had gained weight. And yes, I noticed it was soiled and, and sort of thought to myself, oh, well, oh, gosh. Oh, boy, the last time I wore this, can this be? And, and it, was, it was humorous to me. It was funny. And it was also didn't fit. So back in the closet it went on the floor. Well, hang on a minute. Why, why not? Well, at least I'll get it washed anyway. The next time I'm down to that weight, I'll, I'll be in it. Because that's not how I am. I have a lot of clothes, and um, I was also not a millionaire, so sort of I tended to get things dry cleaned when I was going to wear them again. Had the dress fit, and I was going to wear it to whatever occasion I was looking for something to wear, I would have dry cleaned it. And then 
Months later, as is documented on her tapes, in November, when I had lost the weight and the dress fit again, I was planning to have it cleaned and wear it for Thanksgiving. And that was um, sort of in the famous conversation where she uh, said, oh, you can't clean this and you may need this one day. And to me, that notion was ludicrous. I was never going to talk about this relationship. But how did she get to know about the dress and the fact that there was semen on it? Linda was at my house and, and I was giving her some clothes of mine and we were in the closet and I said, oh look, here's that dress that I was telling you about. Isn't that funny? Something, I might have said something like that. Um, and it wasn't, uh, I had joked with, with one of my best friends about it and said, oh gee, maybe the president will pay for the dry cleaning. So it wasn't, it, it was funny. I, I know but it's, it still it's, feels a trophy in a way, perhaps something that you need. I mean, after you've been through these incredibly dark days in which you'd wondered whether he mm. still loved you, whether he was still involved with you, whether he was ever going to call you, and hell, you had got a dress with a bit of him on it. No, I would have to say that um, probably holding on to things like leaves of grass and, and the gifts he had given me, hat pin, the hat pin were uh, much more filled that need than this dress did. Uh, this dress was, was nothing and was really pretty irrelevant. It had no bearing on our relationship. Did your mom know about the dress? Not until everyone else did. That's, um, that's been a difficult, uh, one of the difficult lies I think that my family has had to deal with for this past year was somehow this, uh, misconception that my mom hid the dress and she uh, I, mean, I remember very vividly when we were uh, it was after the story had broken and we were trapped in the apartment and um, sort of the, was the first talk of, of this dress was on the news and she sort of turned to me and said well, there isn't any dresses there this is ridiculous right and I kind of looked at her and uh, <laughs> I said well she said well where is it? And I said, well, it's in your apartment in New York. And it, that was the first she knew of it. Well, what would you do with the dress if they returned it to you now? I'd burn it. The thing that happened, of course, once you had got talking with Linda Tripp was that uh, the worst of all things happened, and that was the subpoena, the um, order that you would have to testify in the Paula Jones case, she who had accused the president of sexual harassment. I was f terrified to death, I mean, not only of what was going to happen in this case, but I didn't want the president to know that I had confided in anybody and I didn't want anyone to get in trouble. I didn't want to hurt the president. I didn't want to humiliate my family. I didn't want to hurt myself. But this was now the most dangerous phase of the whole business. The wide world yes. was about to find out. And well, I was hoping not. Well, <laughs> I was working very well, hard to not have that happen. Did you feel um, under tremendous pressure? Did, did you feel very depressed? At that point, I was very frightened, very frightened and um, I, I was somewhat depressed. I think that the holiday time that year, it was not knowing what I was going to do, not knowing what was going to happen. 
it was very scary. Monica, can we look at what you've described as the worst day in your life, the mm -hmm. 16th of, of January 1998? Now, two days before this, you've had lunch with Linda Tripp. She's still on the scene. Well, this, uh, this lunch had actually originally been set up uh, the Friday before and was a result of a conversation I had with her where she had uh, expressed to me a change of heart that she now didn't think she would need to, to disclose my relationship with the president and uh, wanted to be uh, sort of vague on, on what she knew or might know. And um, this was a very reassuring conversation for me. So we had made arrangements to sort of iron out her plan uh, over lunch. And um, when I came to the lunch and, and during the lunch, uh, she had seemed to once again shift positions and was going back and forth between I'm going to tell, I'm not going to tell, this is what I'm going to say, I'm not going to say this. And I, at this point, was very, very, very distrustful of her. Um, it was an emotional, long, draining discussion. Which we now know she was taping. Did you have any sense at any time, either then or during any of your phone calls, that perhaps she was making a tape recording of you? I started... Uh, to be nervous about that shortly before the 13th of January and that was um, why when she went to the restroom during our lunch I went through her bag I thought oh maybe she has a tape recorder I was very 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 concerned but the idea of someone wearing a body wire and having gone uh, trying to trap me was not something I had thought of. And yet that specter was to revisit you in a very gruesome way two days later at uh, Pentagon City Yes. Uh, just outside the offices where you worked, um, when FBI agents uh, confronted you and invited you to accompany them, and Linda Tripp was there too. Um, I know you can't speak too explicitly about this period, but... You know, my lawyers have agreed with the Office of the Independent Counsel that I wouldn't discuss the details of January 16th in this interview. But they have no um, possession of your emotions, and I'm just wondering how you felt in the first moments of that encounter. I was, I was terrified. Um, I've never been so afraid in my entire life. It was, um, I lost my breath, the whole world Flash before my eyes, the room was spinning. It was um, terribly, terribly frightening. We know from Kenneth Starr's report that there were nine men in the room, besides the woman who'd now become your enemy, Linda Tripp. Uh, you must have felt desperately alone. I did. Who did you want in that moment? Um, I'm not sure that I can answer that question. Well, I suppose I can say, because again, it's in the Star Report, <sighs> that um, you wanted to call your mother and you wanted to call your lawyer. Pretty natural, um, but you weren't able, really, to do either properly. And uh, that for a good number of hours, two hours in particular, um, you were really under a very close situation. Now, you were up in a, in a hotel in this complex on the 10th floor, room 1012. Mm -hmm. Glass windows, glass roof below. Did you, did you think about just... It was... Um, I remember looking out the window and thinking, well, I can't begin to fathom what's going to unfold here and I can't begin to think of how this is going to hurt the president and hurt my family and I thought well maybe if I'm not here it won't happen so I I am um, seriously considered jumping
the uh, this went on quite a long time and it was a pretty hellish day mm. um, and in a dreadful sort of way don't you feel even now that you're the last person in jail I mean you're the last person with a restriction on you you're the last person I mean the president's given a press conference the president is out um, little trip is on cable television giving her interviews and saying how she saved you from suicide don't well, you feel a little discriminated against um, yes I, I uh, it, it, to be really honest with you sort of e answering that question uh, concerns me I, I, I don't even feel comfortable doing that but it, it, it beggars belief that at this stage anybody would feel that they could get away with jailing you well, when you're the person who would be put in jail, that fear is not far from your thoughts ever. Um, I think my biggest fear today is uh, is losing my immunity and being prosecuted or having my family prosecuted for something to to get to me. Um, in this period uh, that now unfolds with your testimony and your subpoena and your mm -hmm. uh, uh, detailed account of things for the Paula Jones case. Mm. Um, what seems also to be happening is that uh, evidence is being taken from you and from your mother separately and that in some extraordinary way the mother and the daughter are being pitted against each other. It is uh, I think one of the biggest tragedies that has come to light from what's happened in this past year, the realization for a lot of people that in this country, in, in America, that a parent can be forced to testify against a child, it's not right and it's uh, not something that should happen. The threat over you was 27 years in jail and uh, I'm just wondering, in the first moments of discovering in a sense that that Linda Tripp delivered you physically in a kind of Judas way. <laughs> uh, how did you feel about her? Oh. What did she say she... to you? She. Oh. Um. She said that uh, that this was for this was the best thing for me that they had done this to her. Um, she she gutted me. She violated me. She um, she knifed me. Is Hillary Clinton right that um, there is a right wing conspiracy to destroy the president? And if that is the case, have you been a pawn in it? I think so. In both in both regards, I think um, yes, I do. I do think that there is a right-wing conspiracy and um, I think I've definitely been used as a pawn. This um, day was so quickly chased by total discovery in the world mm -hmm. that Monica Lewinsky had had an affair with the President of the United States and I mean I was one of the people who came flying over from Europe to cover events on the in the mayhem on the White House lawn and you were a prisoner in the in the Watergate mm -hmm. watching pictures and mm -hmm. listening to stories about a person who appeared to be Monica Lewinsky mm. people didn't realize that behind the name Monica Lewinsky there was a person and behind that person there was a family and that this was an experience for all of us and we've often joked that uh, you know, my family, we've made an Olympic sport out of throwing things at the TV <laughs> or ripping the newspapers or just screaming at, at people who don't, who aren't in the room. It was, it was horrible. We had all been maligned and trashed in the media. And what about very soon after that? I did mm. not have a sexual relationship with that woman, Monica Lewinsky. Mm -hmm. I remember exactly where I was, sitting on the bed in the apartment, watching TV, legs crossed on the bed, and um, my, my emotions were really split. On the one hand, I was 
relieved and felt that that was it was good that he was denying the relationship and that's what he should do and on the other hand I also felt that I could see and hear in his voice and his actions how very angry he was with me and that hurt he um, he could have denied this relationship in a different way it didn't have to be with such such anger and people in the White House, possibly driven by him, were putting it out that you were a stalker, <laughs> that you entrapped him, that he tried indeed to resist you? Mm. When I came to learn that, that he had indeed said those things, that was the moment in the realization that I fell completely out of love with him. It, um, I had hoped that he had sort of, you know, turned and turned a blind eye and said, "Do what you need to do to protect me, but I don't want to be a part of it." And instead, he was in there, writing all the plays. So, what does that now tell you about the man you thought you loved? That, rather than there being a man, Bill Clinton, he's a hundred percent politician. He's a good politician but a hundred percent politician. The experience of being uh, forced under threat of jail to testify about a very intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you feel violated by that? Very. It was, um, this has been a humiliating, violating, frightening, experience not only for me but for all those close to me as well um, for my parents for my friends one of my my closest girlfriends she and I had our emails published I had documents that had been deleted on my computer that were meant for no one else's eyes to not only be retrieved but printed for the world to read my innermost thoughts intimate private moments between two people being discussed not only by m myself but by others all over the world day after day it's it's disgusting and appearing in front of a grand jury mm. which, which for people outside of america is a difficult thing necessary to conceive of There's a lot of people in the room presumably yes 23 Oh, well, 23 grand jurors and then however many prosecutors. And you? Yes. And some lawyers <laughs> and people. But no, actually, you're not allowed to have your lawyers in the room with the grand jury. You're allowed to have them outside. So, so you, there you are alone. You're alone. Sitting in front of these people. Yes. Did they feel hostile? Um, some did. I, I was before the grand jury twice. And um, the first time I was there, I was much more nervous. And I was questioned by the prosecutors. And I sort of have this tendency to want people to like me, so it was, it was a little disheartening for me that there were people who clearly felt hostile, people who were bored, sleeping. <laughs> but the second time I went back was to answer the grand jurors' questions. And I was able to develop more of a rapport with them and felt more at ease. But you still had to talk about oral oh. sex, for example. Well, um... Fortunately, we were, yes, some of the questions were terribly, terribly humiliating. Um, but the, the worst of my having to discuss those things I did in a private deposition with two of the female prosecutors from the independent counsel's office. Um, and that was, that was degrading and violating. And um, I... I was very worried about the fact that I knew my dad may one day have to see that. And that's not something a, a father should um, have to learn about his daughter. It's this fact that there isn't a country on earth where Monica Lewinsky and these details have not appeared either in oh, the no. internet, in the press, on the television. How does that make you feel? Horrible. Um, it's. It's also still surreal. You cannot imagine what it is like to lose your anonymity until it's happened, and it's something that I 
hope and pray one day I will have back because I miss it. I must tell you, I was in an African country mm. a couple of months ago in Uganda, and uh, I saw a bus pulling out of the Kampala bus station. Mm. It was called the Lewinsky bus to oh, <laughs> And there was a picture of you, your hair, you know, you oh. unmistakably, Monica, the oh. eyebrows. Oh, it's, it, it's bizarre. It is very, very, very bizarre. How can you possibly return to a normal life? What will a normal life be? Oh, I hope, <laughs> I hope it will be um, finding the right person that I can have a meaningful relationship with and eventually get married and have kids, figuring out what I'm going to do with myself, how I can make a positive contribution. It's, I don't know what's in store. What do you know now that you didn't know 13 months ago? What mm -hmm. have you really, what's the sort of central thing you've learned? I know um, that I need to learn to value and honor family more. I know the true definition of a friend, um, how to value that, how important it is. I know um, will you be as married men will <laughs> definite no-nos, <laughs> never again. Um, and trusting, I've I'm actually, I've been disappointed in myself because I find that while I'm more suspicious of situations and I'm more cautious of what I'm doing, I find myself still being too trusting. What um, would you say to Bill Clinton if you were to see him again today? I don't... I think I'd probably want to, at some point, apologize to him for having been indiscreet about the relationship. Um, I don't really know. I don't know if I'd want to see him. I don't know what the point would be. I don't know that I would believe anything he said to me. It's, um, right now I could think of few other people that I'd rather spend an evening with than him. So. Monica Lewinsky, thank you very much for talking with us. Thank you, Mr. Snow.